I was super scared. I was super duper scared. I remember canceling all my plans. It was, it was this email I got before it was kind of on, on the national radar so much by an activist that was more connected worldwide who who really said, boy, this, this is something different. This is next level stuff going on um, and kind of jarred us and our family awake. February 2nd, which was Super Bowl Sunday, I had a sharp pain in my lower left leg. Didn't know what it was. It was very painful and it just, it was bad. And I actually was doing some plumbing work up the street. So um, the pain went away. I did the plumbing. I came home, watched the game. But the next day, February 3rd, the pain came back and it was so severe this time, I could barely walk. Hi, my name is Alex Franz, and I'm the creator of 2020 Unmasked. Thanks for watching. Like you, towards the end of 2020, I realized what a traumatic year it had been. I am also a storyteller, and I believe in the healing power of stories. So I set out to collect the stories of 2020, the good, the bad, the painful, and the enlightening. This is the result. These are real people, and these are their stories. that I couldn't believe that it was happening to the U.S. Um, and that something that basically we're reliving, you know, back in the time when everybody had to go through, um, I can't think of the name of the disease, um, you, know, you know, like basically reliving the past. I mean, with all the advancements that we have, that we were basically reliving the past. Yeah, like my, so like I watched this, you know, like the story was starting to build even in early January. I feel like my only frame of reference for something like this was like the H1M1 flu that from a couple of years ago or SARS. And I was like, okay, this is serious, but it'll last, you know, for a little bit and it'll get under control. Um, so when when it just when it just kept getting worse and worse, it was um yeah, just just constant, I guess, like adjustment and anxiety and sort of grieving. I think initially like I was really overwhelmed with like media and social media. So I had to take some breaks from that and that that help that was essential probably for those those first couple of weeks um and beyond that i think i kind of doubled down on the things that work for me um just on a day-to-day -day basis or I'm, I'm someone who has anxiety and who kind of has for my whole life so i have some strategies um physical activity works really well um, I've meditated more than ever this year, probably, and that helps a lot. And um, just trying to practice acceptance is probably the biggest one for me. I was super scared. I was super duper scared. I remember canceling all my plans. Many of my friends were still kind of continuing and um, kind of thought I was crazy. So I was scared and then also felt like, um, Am I overreacting? You know, like questioning myself? Shock, to be honest with you. I was like, wow. Um, I just, first, I mean, first the shock. And then when I kept seeing the es escalation of the numbers, um, I don't want to get an advice of uh, networks that I like with news network. I rather watch, which I don't like to watch, but the one I'm not too fond of, I felt that their numbers might have been fraudulent. The more I, I mean, I guess I have to look at it on my side. I know a lot of people and through all these people I know, I don't know anybody except for two people that ever really caught it. So, um, and they didn't die. I've heard of people who have family members that were old and seniors and stuff that died. And so I believe more and more, I mean, I know it's there, but I just thought they were trying to throw too much of a scare tactic at it. 
Um, I believe, yes, we need to protect ourselves. I, I, I get all that, but I just thought the uh, fear factor was a little bit over, over the board there because that had a lot of people panicking, you know, over dramatically panicking, you know, instead of like just going to flow, wear your mask, wash your hands for crying out loud. I mean, <laughs> you're that filthy, then, you know, you should be scared. My initial reaction was, um, this is weird. <laughs> You know, um, I have this vivid memory of when 9-11 um, happened and when the first plane hit, we all kind of went, huh, that's weird. And then it took us a while for it to dawn on us what um, what was going on. And that's kind of how I feel about pandemic, you know, like, huh. Um, and then really quickly, within a day or two, it was obvious and um, the executive team started having really serious meetings about closing, closing quickly. Um, and it became really clear to me that this was going to be really serious. And having that um, clergy gathering with the health department, um, where Kurt Egerbrecht looked us in the eyes and said, this is going to get really bad and it's going to get bad fast. Um, and I remember walking out of that and going over to CVS and picking up like toilet paper and hand sanitizer and various <laughs> other things and hearing the um, guy behind the counter talking to somebody and they were kind of poking fun at people who were like purchasing hand sanitizer and Lysol and stuff and I remember thinking like dude you have no idea um and then I did that Sunday at service I did the hand washing I remember that um lesson and then within three days we closed the building and uh but you know on Sunday we thought oh we all just need to wash our hands more <laughs> and um Somebody at church called me and left me a voicemail and said, you know, when you did that hand washing thing, I thought it was cute, but kind of dorky and, you know, um, and now, man, we had no idea, you know, we had no idea. February 2nd, which was Super Bowl Sunday, I had a sharp pain in my lower left leg. Didn't know what it was. It was very painful and it just, it was bad. And I actually was doing some plumbing work up the street. So, um, the pain went away. I did the plumbing. I came home, watched the game. But the next day, February 3rd, the pain came back. And it was so severe this time, I could barely walk. And I, I just could not walk. So anyway, I talked to my cousin. I was going to go hang a TV. And she told me I should go to the hospital. I didn't want to go. But she forced me. So I went. I went to the hospital. And I was in the emergency room for about seven and a half hours. Uh, but because of my previous health, you know, I've had three heart attacks. And because of my previous health, they, they kind of put me at the front of the line. So once they saw that and, you know, the, the pain in my leg and all this stuff, they, they checked me out. I went in, I got there like around four in the afternoon. And I was finally, a doctor came out around 11, 15, 11, 20. And they told me that they found a blood clot in my leg. And I was like, okay, that's where the pain was. Cause whatever it was, it was very painful. And I felt like it was something, I don't know why, but I felt like it was something in my bloodstream, not in my skin or in my bone. I just felt like it was in my bloodstream. So they said they felt a clot in my leg. And I said, okay. And the worst of it is that the, the clot broke off and went into my lung. So from that, they wanted to keep me overnight. I didn't want to stay you know, I went to Pasadena uh, Huntington Hospital and I live in Altadena. I said, hey, I could just go home. They said, we can't make you stay, but we suggest that you stay overnight to kind of, you know, observe you. So I stayed overnight and um, they gave me some medicine and then they released me the next day. Uh, a few days later, I was going back to the Huntington Hospital because I wanted to get my records. And as I was walking, I felt a bit shortness of breath and I couldn't figure out why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm physically flat fit. I do construction work and I'm in good shape. And I couldn't figure out why I was had shortness of breath. So I go to the reception and ask them where I go to get my records. And I told her the shortness of breath. She said, I should go to ER. I'm thinking, no, I don't want to go. I was just here. But anyway, I decided to go. I go to the ER and I'm in there, I don't know, maybe two or three hours. And of course I got moved to the front of the line again. Then they tell me I have pneumonia. They found pneumonia in my right lung. And I'm thinking, wow, it's just, it just keeps getting worse. So they, uh, they released me, they put me on antibiotics and I was on bed rest and this and that. Then 
uh, a day later, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning, Wednesday morning. They told me, we need you to come back to the hospital. We found something in your blood and you need to come back, get somebody to bring you or we'll call the ambulance. And, you know, and I had my phone on sleep mode because I was tired. So I turned it off so it could not be do not disturb mode. But on do not disturb mode, if a person calls you three times, they can get through. So that's what they did. They had, obviously it was an emergency because I was shocked to hear my phone ring and I looked at it, it was like 4.15 in the morning. So my sister takes me to the hospital and they administered me back into the hospital and I'm there for three days. And they told me, first they told me they found something in my blood. Then they told me there was a mistake and somebody read the things wrong, this and that, yada, yada, yada. But then I was released to go home and I was on bed rest for about six weeks. And, you know, this, this was, uh, I was in the hospital November 12th through the 14th. And then I was in the hospital for, I mean, I was at home for six weeks. Now, mind you, the COVID thing, I hadn't even heard the word COVID. I hadn't heard anything about it. And then, um, then in March, mid-March, I'm starting to see some stuff on the news, people getting sick and it's COVID-19. And, and, um, and I'm starting to think, well, I had the signs and symptoms, you know, the blood clots and, and the pneumonia. Um, I had a severe headache one day. It was, it was so bad, it brought tears to my eyes. And then I, I started looking this stuff up and I had the signs and symptoms of what people who have COVID have. Oh man, I can't go to the Texas rodeo this year. That stinks. <laughs> real, real facts. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to go to, I wanted to go to the Texas rodeo livestock show and couldn't and, uh, and our show got canceled. And I was like, oh, I guess this is something we're gonna have to take seriously, huh? All right. I didn't think it was that serious, honestly. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be as big of a deal as it was. It was when I was in Arizona, like watching the news and realizing like stuff was starting to shut down. I was like, oh, wow, this is real. Um, it's much more serious than I had thought. We had kind of a lot of reaction, like I said, because we were really on the fence about um, a trip. You know, we had planned this trip every year. So we have this trip planned for a whole year. And, um, you know, we were on the fence about even going or not because it was right when it was getting so serious. So, um, but I mean, I guess my reaction and most of the people close to me is let's see what's happening and try and react accordingly. You know, nothing, definitely not running out and buying loads of toilet paper and things of the sort, you know? It was this email I got before it was kind of on the national radar so much by an activist that was more connected worldwide who who really said, boy, this, this is something different. This is next level stuff going on um, and kind of jarred us and our family awake. Um, and you know, it was kind of before, it was before schools were closing, before there was uh, the, the shutdown orders in Wisconsin, before um, the sports, you know, NCAA shutting down and other sports teams were shutting down. So I think it was before it was on a lot of people's radar um, that this email kind of shook our family up when we read it and um and you know we, we right from the start took this thing really serious um and different people kind of have different political takes on this whole thing but we right from the start we felt like schools are going to be shutting down and this is going to be lasting a year or two this is not going to just go away from you know three weeks of wearing masks and things like that um so kind of our, our initial reaction was that's a very serious thing um, that there's there's some rational things we can do to manage um, through this whole situation that it's you know it's not magic how how viruses spread there's kind of science behind um, how how germs spread and viruses spread and and real practical reality based ways to manage the risk and you know knowing that every day in life, anybody can die at any time. And so there's always risk everywhere. Um, but at the same time that we kind of felt like this was a pretty high risk um, pandemic that was coming our way and, and we could take some very tangible um, actions in our life to at least lessen the risk. And so we're really serious right from the start and you know, kind of all the hand washing, masking, staying at home, minimizing everything in life, just kind of simplifying everything so that we could just kind of huddle down 
um, and also kind of feeling like this is going to be at least a year. So let's, uh, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So let's kind of manage this in smart ways. Um, it was kind of our approach early on. Um, I also, um, you know, again, kind of back to sort of the, at least the science reality of, of this for, for me, I, I started keeping uh, numbers, keeping track of uh, statistics, uh, both worldwide and United States and, and Wisconsin, um, both the, the confirmed cases and deaths for at all three of those levels. So basically six statistics that I, I track every day. I've been doing every day since uh, the start of March and uh, partly just to kind of kind of have like some real numbers to just see, you know, how much is this really hitting in Wisconsin? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it doubling every four days or eight days or is it slowing down? Um, you know, you, you can get a lot of spin from the news. You can get a lot of um, kind of fear from just all the stuff you hear. Um, but to me, there's, there's something just kind of comforting about numbers, about just really understanding like, yeah, it's growing. Oh, now it's slowing down. Oh, it's doubling now, you know, just to kind of know what's really out there. So um, I guess I've been doing that every day um, since the start of March, so almost a year now. So I've got pages of records and kind of kind of helps me have a sense as to where we are in the pandemic. Is it getting worse? Is it starting to slow down and all that? And um, at least for me, I find that sort of comforting, I guess. Um, but the reality is no matter what the stats are, it, you can get it or not. You can, and you can die from it or not. I mean, there's just a lot of things that are to some extent under that control.